Nobody can stop her but her. This is Miss Jennifer Hernandez. She's here on the show with me today. And look at my awesome bracelet I got. I love this thing, you guys. Anyway, uh, welcome to the show, Jennifer. I absolutely love you. I just wanted you to know that right off the bat. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here. Such a pleasure to meet you and even more of a pleasure to be on your show. So thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. When I heard about your story, it's like, I have to talk to her. I have to meet her. So <laughs> It's, it's absolutely an honor for me. Uh, so tell me a little bit about yourself. Where are you originally from? Where'd you grow up? Uh, so I grew up uh, initially um, when I was born, I lived in Orland Park. Uh, we had a very nice home and then we moved to Tennessee. Um, but then my dad ended up traveling back and I grew up in Orland. Actually, I traveled all over the place until sixth grade and then sixth grade on was in Orland Park. So very cool. Did you like Orland Park? Was it a nice place to be? It was a very nice place to be. It wasn't really for me. Uh, I didn't much care for it, which is why I ended up hanging out my time on the streets of Chicago. Uh, but that was more of uh, more felt like home. Yeah. And I know you had to go through a lot of stuff. I mean, your book specifically says a journey from childhood trauma to a life of abundance. And boy, do you own that. But what was the childhood trauma that you had to overcome? What was that hard stuff? Um, so I had, my mom had a really tough decision with her second marriage to desperately try to save it. Um, her husband, which was my stepfather, wanted to move to Tennessee and she gave me and my brother the option of whether we stay with our father, because we grew up with our mom until um, fifth grade, sixth grade. I was in sixth, my brother was in seventh, and she gave us the option that summer to stay with her and move to Tennessee or to live with our dad and he would take over a sole guardian. So we chose to stay with him. And it was a great choice. It was the best one for us, for sure. And she, that's what she felt as well because of the situation she was in. But I had some abandonment issues. Mom left when I was 11. That was a very tough time for a young girl. So I went through it. And by the time I was 13, I was running away from home, looking for love in all the wrong places. Um, ended up getting me kicked out of high school, straight F sophomore year, sent to an alternative program. <laughs> My parents, my mom did move back a couple of years later. Um, but you know, once you leave, like it's kind of like the damage is done. Like you can't really fix it. Now it's up to me to want to fix it. And I can't fix something that I don't know is broken. And it, at that time, I, you know, I was just a runaway train and they desperately tried to save me from myself and had me locked up in different adolescent facilities. But they're really, it, it, each time it just got worse. It was really up to me to want to change. And I didn't at that moment. So it's hard to change when you don't want to, or you don't realize that you, this is something that you need. Yeah. yeah and you don't realize why you're hurting, you know, yeah. I had no idea, honestly. And it, it's, it's crazy because I was literally in patient facilities multiple times. And then I even went to school at a hospital. So I was there all day long, counseled all day long, and they never got to the core of any of my issues, which is kind of why I'm like counseling. <laughs> yeah, no, because like the thing is, and and, and I'm going to say this and I'm going to say it loudly and I'm going to say it out from stages. I'm, I'm going to say this like parents, if you want to know why there's trauma or where the trauma is coming to look in the mirror, we're all imperfect, but knowing that you're imperfect and trying to fix can, and, and work through the issues that we caused our children. That's right. I'm saying me because I rolled some of those negative behaviors over to my children. And then I have to be the one to help them fix it. But first we have to have consciousness and awareness that we are the problem, you know? And the truth is, is that I just figured out where a majority of my trauma comes from just two years ago. Just two years ago in 2023 was the year that I learned how to love myself. And I'm 46 years old, but I'm so grateful because sometimes people don't learn that in this lifetime. And so I, I'm, I'm glad that I finally have. And now I can have the life that I really desire because I couldn't call in the love that I wanted from someone else or the life that I wanted from someone else when I couldn't even give it to myself. If you're not able to give yourself the love that you desire, how are you how are you going to call in from somebody else? You don't even know what it is because you're not even capable of giving it to yourself. So the most important thing for me is, you know, teaching my kids how to love themselves fully before they bring children into this world or before they enter into a marriage. 
because then they'll be able to keep themselves at the core, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I could not agree with you more. It is so important that we understand what it means to love ourselves because through that, we can understand what it means to properly share love. And we can start to have those healthy boundaries on not letting abusive people into our lives to take advantage of us again and again and again. Yeah. That's a big problem for a lot of people. Yeah. And I think the huge thing is just being able to forgive. And, and the thing is too, is that people don't realize like, guess what? My parents didn't change, you know, they're not, they're not aware of how much trauma really they had that they rolled over to me. And that's okay. Cause they don't have to be aware because I'm aware. So I didn't need them to heal. I just needed to heal myself. And then I can welcome them back in as who they are and set appropriate boundaries for myself. So that way, you know, and, and it definitely changed everything. Like there was a moment where I had to cut everybody off, you know, and now everybody's back, but I'm healed. Like they cannot affect me. And I know where the trauma comes from. So it doesn't affect me in the same way. So if you're getting triggered, dig into your triggers because your triggers are your trauma. That is your trauma. That is something that you hurt from that you're just not aware of. So and I, I know that there was um, an event in your life where you came home to find that your house had been unlocked and vandalized. And I mean, that sounds like something straight out of a horror movie. That's what I felt like when I was a little girl <laughs> and yeah. walked in it all over my walls. I was like, I was so scared and I was home alone. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> let's talk about this. What happened? So my mom worked a lot and she was at work and I walked in the back door and you know, back then they left the door open. I don't even think it, I had a key or maybe I did. I'm not sure. But I walked in and I just go to my bedroom and I throw my bag down and there's writing all over my wall, but it's like scribbled and you couldn't really make out what it said. But then I could see die. Right. And I'm like, call, get on the phone. Like the babysitter was supposed to be there. She's not there. I'm like, what? Help me. <laughs> like what is happening? someone in the house? I was so scared, paralyzed, like couldn't even move. And then I go and I'm on the phone and she's staying on the phone with me and she's telling me to walk through the house, see if anything else is wrong. Well, then there's writing in the bathroom. And then, and then the, the babysitter got there and I felt like so at so much, like at least I felt okay, you know, because I was, I was, ve- I was in third grade, fourth grade. So I was so scared. And, uh, cause I didn't know what, what was going on, you know? Yeah. Wow. And then we found the whole house, like everything was like vandalized. Someone was in her house. So and they destroyed a lot of things and popped my mom's water bud. Goodness. And how old were you? So, I mean, I had to be, if I was 11 and six, I was like nine years old. Goodness gracious. Nine years old, you know, like, I mean, it was a different day back then, but still like to walk in and see that. Yeah, I was petrified. And then my mom blamed me and I was like, oh, what? <laughs> Not cool, mom. Like, well, and just think about, you know, what's funny is now that I'm talking about it and I guess I can see why that was very important for them to share because that must have caused me so much trauma, actually, mm-hmm. to, to be a nine-year-old whose house is vandalized and then your mom thought it was, why would I ever write on my walls like that die or kill you like that, or, you know, break, like there was so much vandalism. And I know that that was my mom just being very scared because she had, she was receiving calls and other things that I wasn't aware about. Um, so she was freaking out really in, but to blame me, like it was really weird. <laughs> yeah. Really weird. Yeah, I literally talk about trauma. I cried myself to sleep. Like, I just <laughs> like, cause how could you think I could do that? Yeah. You know? And then I, I think I don't pay attention to like all those details of like how much that really could have broke my spirit. Right. right. Um, but yeah, it definitely, she, I mean, she didn't trust you. She didn't believe you. Yeah. You didn't and feel I'm safe not, in that moment. And I'm nine years old, you know, it's very interesting. And I just like brush over a lot of things, you know, because I'm not, um, I've never been a victim of my circumstances. I'm grateful for all of my circumstances. And because of that, I think it, it takes me longer to be like, oh yeah, this is why, you know, just like my dad, I couldn't see a lot of the trauma he caused me until the last couple of years, because he was my only parent for 
quite some time. He did the best he could do. And I was super grateful for him. And I don't know where I would have been without him, but he caused a lot of damage. And I continued to look for men like him, you know, and I couldn't see it and I didn't know it. And that was because I wasn't a victim of it, but like, that's why too, we have to pay attention to like those triggers because that those triggers are what helped me identify the emotional damage that was really caused, you know? Right. Absolutely. I love that you have recognized it and you decided that you were time, it was time for you to start working on it. Yeah. And I know that counseling did not help you uh, mainly because there wasn't a whole lot of help in that world when we were growing up. That's just not the way that was done. If there was something wrong, then it was wrong with you and you needed medications. They were giving band-aids instead of shovels to get to the bottom of the problem. Yeah. So how did you dig to the root? How did you find the problem? Not through that, but (laughs) but I, I have to say, you know, Um, The one advice or tip that I'll give people on that, I'm not saying counseling is great and we all need it. And I, I still, you know, I have, um, I do work with people like psychotherapists and different people like that. Like I do have my mentor and my team that I go to because we all need somebody, but you need to make sure that they do their work because we all have trauma and we end up in that field because of the trauma. So if you don't ever do your work, you can go get a you can go get a degree. A degree doesn't give you anything, in my opinion. But if you're not doing your work, you're not even qualified to advise somebody. So my advice is to make sure that whoever you're going to work with is doing their work. And really what happened to me is I got blessed because I didn't know about anything really positive. Like all of these things were like, um, it's just very foreign. And it was, you know, when I was, uh, you know, the internet was just starting and things like that. There wasn't like YouTube. So now, you know, I, I, is what I tell people, people have a heightened level of consciousness now and their your children want you to do your work. And actually some of them are going to require that you do their work or they're not really going to have a life with you because they don't want that carried over into their family. And there's, there's, we're more aware now than ever, but I actually just got in the back of the room and listened to people who were motivational and inspirational and people were, that were where I wanted to be. I needed to be in those rooms and listen to those people because no one else other than people who are where I want to be can advise me on anything because you can't listen to somebody who hasn't even been to where you're at. You know, you can't take advice from people who haven't even had the heightened level of success that you have, and they're going to give you some piece of advice of how you're going to get to where you're going to go. And for a lot of years, I felt like so misunderstood because my head is so in the clouds. Like I have these big, gigantic dreams and most people can't wrap their head around those, you know, because they're so, they're so big and So, yeah, I mean, you just, you just got to follow those who are where you want to be. And that's what I teach my children and I'm following my own advice. (laughs) And speaking of your kids, there's one part, I actually even marked it out in the book because I love this part so much where you're having (laughs) issues with your kiddo (laughs) and she walks past you into the bathroom. She says, I need you to sit in the bathroom while I shower. And she's practically begging you. Yeah, And (laughs) she says something to you that kind of gets your blood boiling. (laughs) What happened? Tell me about that, that moment. What led up to that and what happened? I was working 60 plus hours a week in the car business and trying to provide a better life for us. And I had like one day off a week and I tried to give them time too, you know, and it was just not enough time in the day. And so that one day off, I had a grocery shop up and do laundry and do all the things. And she's like, sit in the bathroom while I'm in the shower. I'm like, I don't have, I can't do that. <laughs> she's like, yes. I'm like, no, baby, I'll be right here. Just go in the shower. No problem. And she was so upset. She went in the shower, turned the shower on and must've thought that I couldn't hear her. And she said a four lever word and it was just really foul, really, really foul. You have to buy the book to know what she said, but <laughs> It was really, really foul. And I I walked in there and I was like, what did you just say? She's like, nothing. (laughs) Oh no, you did. I said, don't ever say that again. Oh, and then I walked out of the bathroom and I just felt so hurt. 
because I knew that she needed she needed time with me. And it was, she was acting out and doing something to get my attention because she needed more of me. So I, when she got out, I, I gave her like the time that she needed in that day. But yeah, and it, it, it made me know that I needed to switch careers or figure something out. And I got blessed shortly later and they fired me and I walked into a much better, <laughs> a much better way of life. So, <laughs> and I love in the book that you outline that you recognize uh, that she was needing time with you because she was acting out in the same ways that you acted out as a kid. Yep. Yep. That's the yep. first step to helping somebody else with their trauma is to see yourself in them. Well, and that's the thing. And that's what I knew for sure with uh, being a parent is that I knew if I didn't pay attention when they did that, then I would lose them because my parents didn't pay attention until it, I, I was already set in my ways there was no way they were pulling me back. So I knew that as soon as that started, I had to attack it immediately because God forbid I didn't, I was basically going to deal with a little Jenny that I couldn't deal with. <laughs> so, right. I mean, you um, got wrapped up in being in gangs and stuff in Chicago. That's the last thing that you want to see your kid do. I was doing a lot of drugs too. Like a yeah. lot of drug use. Like I didn't really talk too much on you know, one book is just very hard to like go through the whole story, but I mean, I did a lot of drugs and sold drugs and I did a lot of not good things, you know? Yeah. And, um, yeah, I, I don't know how my parents went through that and I can't even imagine going through that as a parent. So I knew, and it's funny because there was other times like as teenagers, I'm going to tell parents something sophomore year. There's something about that year. That's the year. That's the turning year. If you don't pay attention that year, do not be mad because you're not getting them back. They're, you'll try, but it's going to be up to them to pull themselves back because each one of my kids sophomore year tried to go left and I had to like, you know, pull them back in. And I, I mean, I had to take doors off the hinges and all types of things because I'm that parent. <laughs> so like, There's no way I can't let you do this. I know what happens. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I've been there. Not teaching me nothing new. <laughs> oh, and they were yeah. so, you know, they tried to be so slick, but I was because of my life that I lived, like they never got away with anything. There was one time they did a really good job of a cleanup after a party. And I had bought a case of water the day before, and it was a 24 pack of water. There was only three bottles left. I'm like, so everything was clean. I had no idea there was a party, but I'm like, how in one day did you drink a whole case of water? explain that to me. They're like, geez. I'm like, yeah, you're never going to outwit me. Nice try though. You got rid of the garbage. I see you emptied the garbage cans. Like you did the whole thing. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> you have to pay attention to the details, parents. Yeah. There's some serious responsibility in there with being able to clean up their stuff too. Yeah. So, well, I mean, it, were, it was fear of their mother. <laughs> it's a good thing to have yes <laughs> uh, it is the literature the younger two didn't have very much fear right you I feel uh, we we change as we grow older as a parent um yeah. I was a lot harder on the younger two than I am on the older two yeah. um but that's also because I've healed and I recognize some of my wrongdoings right and some of my trauma so yeah and how old are they all now so um, 26, my stepson, I've raised him since he was four. He's 26. Uh, my oldest is 25. And then I have 17 year old boy, girl twins. Wow. Yeah. So they're 17. All to... Are they going through some stuff right now? Yeah, they're really good. Like they're really good. I'm really blessed. Um, the first two put me through enough, but we had a, we had a lot that happened in a short period of time. So, yeah. We did. So tell me a little bit about this amazing bracelet that I am wearing. It says, no one can stop me, but me. Is this something that you adopted as your own kind of mantra in life kind of early on, or is this a new thing for you? Well, it's funny because I didn't, um, the name of the book came from when I was speaking with my mentor. He's like, you know, I've, re I've worked with a lot of entrepreneurs. He's like, what do you think is so special about you that you're able to implement you know, I'm able to think about wanting something and, and make it happen very quickly. 
And I said, well, because I know I'm the only one in my way, you know, and no one can stop me but me. He's like, that's it. And I'm like, yeah, because that's it. Like, we don't understand our power. We are the only ones to prevent everything in our life. And it's like, there's so many people who don't take responsibility for their own actions. And they're like, oh, you're attacking me. You're not doing this. This person is doing, you know, these people aren't doing what needs to be like. So that's a victim. You're being a victim of your circumstances. Truly, actually, you're projecting. You're getting what you're giving. What you don't realize is all those things that you're feeling, that's what you're giving other people. Look in the mirror, people. We are 100% responsible for all that we call into our life. And the minute you know that is the minute you can make the shift. And so the bracelet, the reason why it's so important is because the first thing that I did when I was learning about limiting beliefs and trying to reprogram the way that I thought is we have to shut that little negative voice in our head up. It's never going to go away. Everybody has it. We all deal with it. But you need to stifle it. And you need to know that, that all that's going to do is keep you where you are. It will never allow you to get to where you're going. So that bracelet, you can, I mean, I, I used rubber bands, but what I'm hoping is, is that people will use my bracelet and snap yourself every single time you have a negative thought. And we don't realize how many negative thoughts go through our brain on a daily basis. But like, I'm fat. I don't look good in this. I look ugly today. Oh, uh, you know, all, all of the things, you know, and if we can just keep doing that for, if you do that for like a month, your brain is starting to be programmed to shut it out the minute that it happens and you're not giving them any thought. So like why you're feeding your, all of these negative things to yourself, like, Oh, you know, the whole world is against me right now. They're stopping me from being great. No, the only one who's stopping you is you look in the mirror, do your work, stop your crying and your victimizing you're in control of your life. No one, but you can stop you. So that's why it's very important. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> it has come to that point now where I have to ask my last question, as sad as that is, because I could sit here and talk to you for hours. <laughs> <laughs> but my last question is always my favorite question because it changes every day, depending on where you're sitting in yourself right now. Yeah. What is one thing that you love about yourself that's not related to your physical appearance? Um, I, the first thing that comes to my head is just no limits that I have that I, I truly believe that I can have anything in this world, like anything. And I, you know, that's a special skill to master. It's taken a lot of work and, um, I'm, I'm so grateful for it, you know? Because I used to cry why me and I stayed stuck there for a very long time and I was hurting and I'm still, I'm, I'm still hurting. This is like, this is a process, you know, because as we evolve, the lessons get harder. I feel like in the last six months, I have literally buried the old version of myself. I feel like I just threw the last bucket of dirt on my grave because that person who I was before, she's gone. Like she does not exist. She's, I'm not the same person, you know, and you can be too. Like anybody can be, you can be different tomorrow. You just have to make the choice for you of what you want in life, but you gotta be a hundred percent responsible for you. No, everything is not happening to you. It's happening for you. It's happening for you to push you to your next level because you're going to get a choice to decide. Are you going to do right? by people or are you going to go left because not everybody is great you know you're going to make that choice but you're going to have to live with the repercussions of that so if you've enjoyed this episode please make sure you check out the episode description you'll find links there on how you can learn more about this guest links to connect with them on social media and how to support the podcast remember I don't get paid to do this. My boss is a bit tight-fisted, but I can say that. I work for myself. <laughs>